Well, again, good morning. It is a gift to be with you this morning on this Saturday, June the 9th, 2018. I am grateful to the Catholic Leadership Institute for everything that they have blessed us with. PMD has been a powerful gift in my life. I know that in your life, all the testimonies that we have heard from you Saturday after Saturday, as well as all the personal comments, continue to illustrate just the way that God is moving in your life in the way that PMD has been a real gift to us. CLI also continues to bless us in other ways. The the Good Leaders, Good Shepherds uh, program has made an impact in the lives of our pastors, and we're have continued just to benefit in our relationship with them and and continued consultation and coaching. So I just want to begin today by saying thank you to God for the gift of our relationship with CLI, the way that the Catholic Leadership Institute has blessed you with PMD and everything that God has done in our lives in a variety of ways. Uh, Today, we're going to celebrate a big diocesan update. Every time that we gather for PMD, uh, CLI is gracious enough to give us a block of time where we are able to celebrate with you what's happening in the diocese. Sometimes those diocesan updates are five minutes. Sometimes they're much larger and longer because of what God is doing. And today, as we have been in conversation with them, we both just thought it would be a great idea if we extended the space and place of the diocesan update to kind of help us further appreciate the way that PMD is not only impacting your life, but impacting our parishes. And so today, in our diocesan update. We're going to look at two things this morning. The first thing is we're going to look at the church's vision for forming missionary disciples. Then we're going to take a look at Bishop Fobb's vision for forming missionary disciples. Everything that CLI has shared with us around forming missionary disciples kind of sets us up for a further appreciation through the lens of the scriptures in the church this morning, then through the lens of Bishop Fobb. We're going to take a break for lunch, and then after lunch we'll gather again Kristen's going to walk you through some conversation around discernment. What is discernment? How is it that we discern? And specifically, what's your role in your parish and how can you get real clear on that? We're really clear that a lot of you, as you were asked or invited to join the PMD, uh, the Parish Missionary Disciple Formation here on Saturdays, many of you were asked to be a part of this because your pastor has a vision for what he wants in the parish with adult formation. And as that vision of how he wants to form adults is clear, he invited you to be a part of that uh, eventual leadership and to form you for that ministry, he and invited you to join us here at PMD. Some of you are going to be a part of other ministry. Maybe it's youth ministry and youth formation as we reshape CCD and youth ministry in parishes. Or maybe it's another ministry. And again, your pastor thought that coming to PMD would be a real aid for you in forming you for what God is calling you to in the future. For some of you, God just brought you to PMD because he wanted you to grow and to receive those graces. And that's awesome. And as you hear, the implementation of the strategic plan beginning to heat up on a parish level. As you hear things about adult formation and youth formation, maybe some of us are asking questions of, are you going to be doing that? And so what we want to do today is spend the afternoon talking about discernment. We're going to give you a tool that you can use to discern with your pastor what's your role and to celebrate what God's doing in your life. So we're really excited about what this day is going to be as we celebrate the gift of the place and space of a diocesan update with you today. So let's begin this morning by sinking into the church's vision for missionary disciples, for forming missionary disciples, and just want to do a little word association with you. Something that will kind of help warm us up this morning. So as we look at the following words, just just tell me what rises to your heart if you know what these words mean, right? So how about that word, summer? We all know what that means in South Louisiana. We know when it starts, we know when it ends, we know what it feels like, we know what our experience tells us, and we know when we're in it, right? So we know what the word summer means. That's pretty clear. How about that heat index? Boy, we know what that means, right? In South Louisiana, we know what the heat index is. We know how it relates to the word summer, and we understand what the experience of the heat index is. We also know what this word means, air conditioner. None of us are foreign to that. We know what it looks like. We know what our experience of an air conditioner is. And we know its connections. The definition of an air conditioner connects to a heat index or to the summer. We understand the way that it relates to those things. How about this word? Hurricane season. We all know what that word means, right? 
It's got a, a tight definition. We know when hurricane season begins. We know when it ends. We understand why the water temperature is connected to the start date and the water temperature in the Gulf is connected to the end date. And we, unfortunately, all have our own experience that tells us, ah, it's hurricane season. All of these words have a very specific definition. We know what they are. It, it can't be really rationalized away. Hurricane season, air conditioner, heat index, summer, all of these words have tight definitions. We know what they are. Now, what about that word? Christian. Now think about that. You're probably looking at that word and you you probably are gathering a definition to it. However, is the definition of the word Christian as tight as the other words that we just looked at? Because uh, right now, if I went to Christ the Redeemer tomorrow at Mass and and, uh, looked at uh, what we said, 1350 on the weekend, if I looked at 1350 people on the way to Mass and I asked them all to define the word Christian, would I get the same definition from everybody? No. No right? A lot of people look at the word Christian in lots of different ways. Some of us look at the word Christian through our own experience. Others look at the word Christian through the experience or the lifestyle of other people, right? And depending on where you might say we are in life or depending on where we are in our experience of of God in general might even influence the way that we look at the word Christian. In the name of Christianity, or in the name of the word Christian, some pretty dramatic things have happened in life, right? The establishment of the university system. Uh, You might even say that the the sustaining of the healthcare system. In the name Christian, more people are fed, educated, and cared for every day on this planet than in any other name. And in the name Christian, some pretty dramatic things have happened, like the Crusades, And some of the atrocities that went along with that. Or the Inquisition. And some of the atrocities that went along with that. Even today, we unfortunately see violence and war in the name of Christian. Some of us would look at the word Christian and say, well, I I consider myself one, but I want to qualify because I'm not like that. Some of us would say I'm a little bit more on the traditional side. Some of us would say I'm a little bit more on the free thinking side. A lot of us would look at the word Christian and we would say, if anybody asked you, yes, I am a Christian, but let me qualify what I really mean by that. In other words, if you look at the word Christian, it is not as tightly defined as the other words that we just looked at. In fact, the word Christian only appears in the Bible five times. Believe it or not, something as, I mean, globally unifying as the word Christian only appears in the Bible five times. The most explicit time it is in the Bible is in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. I'm going to read that with you. You can read it with me. It says that, uh, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that arose because of Stephen went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews. There were some Cyprites or Cyrenians among them, however, who came to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks as well, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and encouraged them all to remain faithful to the Lord in firmness of heart, for he was a good man filled with the Holy Spirit and faith. And a large number of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a large number of people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. So here's what's happening, right? Um, After Stephen is martyred, um, there is a great scattering of the people who were following Jesus, right? And it says in that second line that they went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. They just kind of spread out, and they're basically preaching the word to the Jewish people because at this point, they just consider themselves to be Jews who have found the Messiah, which is what the Jewish faith is really all pointed toward. It's looking for the Messiah. And, And it says that some of them went to Antioch, 
and began to speak to the people who weren't Jewish, maybe to, to the Greeks as well, right? And so whether you were Jewish or not Jewish, they were just proclaiming Jesus to these people. And the news about this, it reaches Jerusalem. So the apostles say, well, go find out what's happening there. So they send Barnabas, who eventually goes to get Paul, and the two of them eventually land in this place called Antioch. And it says right there, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. It was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Now, I want us to note here that as this is the first time that we see in the scriptures that uh, we are actually using the word Christian, that there's a very specific group of people who are called Christians, right? It's not just a general type of person. It's not just anybody who would say, I believe in Jesus, right? Um, that we might say even, even today, the first time that we actually use the word Christian, see the word Christian in the scripture, it actually refers to a very specific person. And it says that it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians, Now, you can define the word Christian almost any way you want, but that word right there, disciple, that's a word that's locked in with tight clarity. Christian can be defined lots of different ways, but the word disciple has a very specific definition. And when you look at the scriptures, the word disciple has has three things about it, right? We know that the disciples of Jesus were not the only disciples in the scriptures. We know that the disciples of John the Baptist were actually invited to go follow Jesus and become his disciples. So the word disciple is not necessarily isolated to Jesus because John the Baptist has his. So if you were a disciple of anybody, what you would do is you would A, learn from the master. You would learn what the master teaches. Number two, you would then teach what the master taught. And number three, you would live like the master. That's what a disciple is. A Christian can be defined in lots of different ways. A Christian can kind of teach to the whatever degree that they feel convicted, um, any level of orthodoxy. They can kind of live with a real general parameter there. But a disciple, that's very different. A disciple in the scriptures, the word disciple is very different. A disciple learns what the master teaches, teaches what the master taught, and lives like the master. So as we are looking at what the scriptures say about forming missionary disciples, as we are together today learning about what the church says about forming missionary disciples, as we have been in PMD this entire time beautifully receiving from CLI a rich, beautiful formation about being a missionary disciple, just a real quick reminder, that's what the the word disciple means. It means to learn what the master taught, to teach what the master taught, and to live like the master. Now, the first two, to live, to, to learn what the master teaches and to teach what the master taught, those first two aren't real hard as they would be compared to the last one, right? To live like the master, especially if we're a disciple of a person, Jesus Christ, that can elicit the question of how do we do that? Because if we're forming missionary disciples then that's what we're forming in parishes. What we're forming in parishes is people who do the same thing. They learn what Jesus taught, they teach what Jesus taught, and they live like Jesus. And I think that if we're going to form missionary disciples in parishes, the question is, how do we do that? Well, Jesus, because he obviously wants us to form disciples, all right? You can't be a disciple of Jesus unless you eventually form other disciples. That's what it means to be a disciple. If we're going to form disciples, then it's actually given to us right there in John chapter 15. And John 15, verses 1 to 15 and verse 16, 1, 1 through 5 and verse 16, excuse me, it reveals to us, you might say the blueprint of what Jesus has in store for us. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 5 and 16. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and everyone that does, he prunes so that it does bear more fruit. He says, you are already pruned because of the word I spoke to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. It was not you who chose me, but I who chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So this is what Jesus is giving to us as, you might say, a blueprint for forming missionary disciples. Now we know what a disciple is, right? To learn what the master teaches, to teach what the master taught, and to live like the master. So then we ask how Jesus says this is how. He gives us this illustration in John chapter 15, verses 1 to 5 and 16. And I want us to notice two things. Number one, I want us to notice how many times he talks about barren fruit. Because if we're gonna if we're gonna form missionary disciples in our parishes, whether that be with adults or youth, but here's the call: the call of the church right now is to form missionary disciples. If we're gonna do that, we need to bear fruit because a lot of us know what it's like to exhaust our energies in our parishes with with, with the greatest of intent. If 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 energy or busyness were the litmus test for successful parishes, then you wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't be in a strategic planning process. The church would not be in the state that it is. We would not have lost 30% of our Catholics in the last 40 years, right? If being busy were the only requisite, you might say, the only prerequisite for forming disciples, it just be busy, well, then we wouldn't be here today. But that's not what's happening, right? We're not bearing fruit. We aren't seeing the fruit of our energy. We aren't seeing the fruit of our labor. And we're certainly not seeing lasting fruit, it says, that will remain. So imagine, just for a second, if today, if in not only our conversation today, but in our continued formation with you, our walking with you, his walking with you, in a life of being a missionary disciple, if you would begin to see fruit that was remaining in people's lives. Would you want that? Because if we want to see fruit being born in our labor, then the key is for us to remain in him. That's what he's inviting us all into. He says the key for us, if we're going to see fruit being born in our forming of missionary disciples, is we need to remain in him. To the degree that we can remain in him, is the degree that we're going to see fruit being born, right? It's not about us. It's not about another technique. It's not about another program. If you're waiting for a program, for, the, for us to give you a program to implement in your parish that will transform your parish, here, here it is. This is the program. It's going to look different than what you think. If you want to see fruit being born in your parish, remain in him and teach other people how to do that. He says, remain in me as I remain in you, right? Who, and you can't do this unless you remain in the vine. You can't do anything unless you remain in me. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. Why? Because without me, you can do nothing. We can't do anything. We're not going to see the fruit unless we remain in him. So I want to give us an image today. You might say a singular image. It's the best I got, but it is the one that I hear people talk most about. An image that I think that if we could wrap our minds around it would help us appreciate how it is that we are being called to, you might say, live and how it is that we're being called to form other missionary disciples. And that is the image of a chair. So I want us to imagine that you and I are all together right now sitting in that chair. Imagine that that chair is Jesus. So if we're made by God for God, where are we supposed to live? We're supposed to live in Jesus. We're supposed to live in the chair. So imagine that that chair is God. You know I am supposed to live there. So what he's saying to us in John chapter 15 is that you and I are supposed to remain in him. We're supposed to remain in the chair. And to the degree that we are staying in the chair, to the degree that we are remaining in him, that is where we're going to see fruit being born, right? So if we're supposed to live there in the chair, and if that's what we're called to do ourselves, if that's what we're called to teach other people how to do, then the question for us today, again, is how? How is it that we remain in him so that we can see the fruit being born? Well, I think a lot of us perhaps are caught up in the way that a lot of Americans think, and that is we often define ourselves by the mission, by what we do, 
right? A lot of us came to PMD because you were going to be asked to do something. And a lot, as you got here to PMD and you were meeting other people and people said, oh, tell me a little bit about yourself, you probably started with what you do. We live in a culture that values um, lots of things and whether it knows it or not, it places a high value on our mission. Guys experience this a little bit differently than women, but I think it's certainly out there as a guy talking to guys, I can tell you that it is a lot of pressure on us to succeed, to provide. Uh, Guys often try to prove who they are through what they do. It's our mission, right? And our mission, if we are acting like that, that's first and foremost. And to the degree that we are successful in the mission, well, then it forms our identity positively. But to the degree that we are failing in the mission or struggling in the mission or struggling in what we do, then that's going to have a big impact on our identity, right? So what we see happening in a lot of people is our mission informs our identity and then depending on how we feel about ourselves our identity then shapes our relationship with God so what we see the paradigm that we see happening across America right now is that mission informs our identity and our identity forms our relationship so just stop right there for a second as you're hearing all this as you're seeing all this I want you to think about your own life And I want you to think about how influential in your life those three words are. And I want you to think about the people who God's going to probably call us to walk with, to work with, how many of them, their relationship with God is based off of who they perceive themselves to be, and that is really formed by their mission in life. The first time I ever heard this was from the Institute for Priestly Formation. I have a great love for what IPF does and a deep affection for the way that they have helped me in my life. And it is with permission, uh, explicit permission, uh, noting that this came from the Institute for Priestly Formation that I share it with you today because there's got to be another way to be. Because if we're going to be disciples, if we're going to live in God, if we're going to live in the chair, then we cannot... Think like, act like the way that you might say a secular American who defines their mission first, their identity comes from that, and their relationship with God flows from that. That can't be the way that it works. You probably see where we're going here. we got to flip that on its head, right? We have to have, first of all, our relationship with God is first and foremost. Whether I am successful or not has no bearing on the, the reality that I am a son of God claimed by him and adopted by him in baptism. My identity comes from my relationship with God. Nothing is more important than my relationship with God. So whether the mission is flourishing, my relationship with God is first and foremost. If the the mission is, is floundering, then my relationship with God is first and foremost. If the economy is doing great, if the price of oil in South Louisiana, if the recent layoffs or an uptake in the oil field if if all of that goes up and down, my relationship with God is first and foremost. My vocation as a married man, as a married woman, as a husband or a father is always flowing from my relationship with God. I am first and foremost his. And, and, and that's what Jesus embodied, right? If we're going to learn what Jesus taught and teach what Jesus taught, if we're going to live like Jesus, we know that Jesus did not put his mission prior to his relationship with the Father, right? Our relationship with God is number one. That is what tells us who who, who we are. When I know whose I am, then I know who I am. When I know that I belong to God, then I know who I am. My relationship with God forms my identity. And then from there, I receive my mission. My mission is not something I do for Jesus. My mission is something that I receive from Jesus and that I do in the chair, right? So if we're going to remain in him because we can't bear fruit on our own, then what we know is that we have to live relationship identity mission with our relationship with God coming first, So if you have been sitting in PMD week after week wondering when are we going to finally tell you what you're supposed to be doing, when are you going to finally get your mission, today is the day your mission is your relationship with Jesus Christ.
There is no program that we're going to give you. There is no thing that we're going to ask you to do that is going to trump that. The most important thing that we are going to ask of you, that the church is asking of you, your pastor is asking of you, is to live in the chair, to have a relationship with the Trinity to be who God created you to be. Your relationship with God is the mission. There is no other mission than that. In fact, that's what we see in Acts of the Apostles. Go with me back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. The first time that they were called Christians, right? It was the disciples. And look, right? It's What is it that happened? Barnabas got there. He saw all these people living in the chair. He said when he arrived, he saw the grace of God. And he encouraged them to what? Remain faithful to the Lord in firmness of heart. And that, it was the way they were living in the chair. It was there in Antioch that those disciples were first called Christians, right? So our relationship with God is the mission. If you don't, if you forget everything else from the day, in fact, if you forget everything else from PMD, in fact, if you forget everything else from the entire strategic plan, and the only thing that you remember is this, that relationship with God is the mission, then we have succeeded, right? That nothing else is more important than that. Because that's where we're going to receive what he's asked us to do with him rather than doing things on his behalf. I think the reason we're not seeing fruit is because we often get together in meetings and we come up with these great ideas and then we ask God to bless our good ideas. God is not interested in blessing our good ideas. God is interested in sharing the mission with us. He is interested in giving us his ideas, right? Our relationship with God is the mission. And if we're going to live in the chair, then we have to be honest about the things that pull us out the chair and the things that help us stay in the chair. In other words, the chair, that's God. We need to live there. Now, none of us are going to do it perfectly, but just because we don't do it perfectly doesn't mean that we don't hold it in front of us as the invitation That would not be of God. Just because it's hard to stay in relationship with God doesn't mean that that's that's what God wants, right? That's what he's calling us to do. Our relationship with God is the mission. So the first thing that we need to do is we need a renewed commitment to prayer, to communion with Christ, right? That's why we've talked to you about Aramis. That's why we've taught you some of the basics of Lexio Divina or imaginative prayer. That's why we've talked to you about relational prayer of acknowledge, relate, receive, and respond. That's why we've spent so much time in PMD teaching you how to pray spontaneously, Right When I'm in the chair, right, I have a relationship with Jesus, and that's all prayer is, is responding to God who wants to have a relationship with us. And if we are going to live in the chair, then we have to have a renewed commitment to prayer. Now, I know that a lot of us might pray in the car. I know that a lot of us might pray at Mass. I know a lot of us might pray for other people. But if we are going to be mature Christians, then we need a mature prayer life. Now, I say this with great love because I know a lot of us are busy. I know life is busy. We're moving faster than ever. I know that life gets more complex, especially when you add things in your life like PMD and perhaps ministry and things like that. But look at me. None of that can be more important than us making time for prayer. And I'm not talking about simply the devotions or simply all the other things that are, that are beautiful, pious exercises or spiritual exercises. I'm talking about what, we've, what we have defined as prayer through Aramis and in the beautiful teachings of PMD, having a relational component, some relational time with the one who loves us, or we're, we're, we're going to eventually get seduced out the chair. We need a renewed commitment to Christ. Number two, we need to live aware. St. Ignatius of Loyola, who we're going to talk a lot about that in the second presentation this morning, he defined discernment through three words, right? He said we have to be aware, we have to understand, we have to take action. We have to be aware of what's going on in our heart. Number two, we need to be to understand whether that comes from God or not, and then we just need to respond the way that God wants us to. But if we're going to live in the chair, we have to be aware of what's cooking in our heart, what's going on in our heart throughout the day, because it's there in our heart that the subtle temptations for us to leave the chair and the 
subtle and sometimes dramatic invitations for us to stay in the chair are going to happen. It's in our heart. And yet we live certainly in a time where either because of the pace of life or because of our our schedules are so taxed and there's not the time for silence or because we don't know how to recognize things in the silence or because we often have the temptation to fill up free moments with technology or our devices, we, we aren't necessarily aware of our interior life. But if we're going to live in the chair, we have to grow in our maturity of living aware of what's happening in our heart. And so we just ask the questions like, what are the things that pull us out the chair? What are the things that pull us out of our relationship with God? What are the different stirrings in the day that make me or cause me to be in a bad mood? What are the different things that stir in the day that that cause me to be in a good mood? What are the things that that irritate me? What are the things that tempt me? What are the things that lead me to sin? What are the things that that give me hope? What are the things that help me be more committed to God, right? In other words, to the degree that we are aware of what's happening in our interior life, well, then, we're, then we know how to stay in the chair, right? And if we're going to stay there, then we need virtue, right? We need to say yes to the things that help us stay in the abiding, and we need to say no to the things that pull us away from God. Now, all of this is a lifestyle. All of this is a lifelong commitment. None of this can happen overnight. And none of this is going to be, you might say, simple or, or just a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. Like we're always working, right? We're always progressing. We're always walking the journey. But if we are aware of where we're heading, then we are aware of how to get there, you might say, right? So our virtue, one of the things that I see all the time is as, as people are growing closer to the Lord, when they don't take into consideration how serious it is for us to say yes and to say no, then we can sometimes underestimate the difficulty of what it's like for us in the spiritual life. And finally, we need to be accountable to people. We need people in our life, right? We need people in our life who want our holiness more than we do. We need people in our life who want our holiness, who want us to stay in the chair, and who know the places in our life where we often get tempted and are there to pray with us, to support us, and to hold us accountable. So if we're going to be a people who are disciples, who are learning what the master taught and who are teaching what the master taught and who are living like the master, then when you look at the way that Jesus lived his life, look at those five things right there. Do you believe that Jesus knew that his mission was his relationship with the Father. Yes, absolutely, right? Do you think that Jesus was committed to prayer? Of course he was. Do you think Jesus was living aware of what was going on in his heart? Of course he was. Do you think that Jesus was able to say no to temptation and yes to virtue? Of course he was. And was Jesus smart enough to make sure that he was held accountable to things. Well, of course, we see that in his relationship with the Father, but even Jesus had 12 people that he walked with on a daily basis. So if we're going to live like him, well, then that's how we can live like him. And if we're going to form people as missionary disciples, wouldn't it be amazing if that were a foundation of what we saw in our lives and what we wanted to see in other people's lives? If we're going to live in the chair, if we're going to be disciples, then we start here today. We don't want to get caught up in our mission that then tells us who we are and then then that tells us what our relationship is, right? We have made those mistakes in the Catholic Church long enough. What we need is we need to take seriously our relationship with God, then forming our identity, then equipping us for mission, and those are the five things that we need. So we're going to take a break right now, and we're going to give you lots of time at your tables to unpack those things that are on the the screen right there. We want to take a couple seconds in small groups right now, and we want to encourage you to actually get into parish groups. Some of us at tables are actually sitting with, uh, with, with people who are in other parishes. We would encourage you to get into groups as small as your parishes, right? And to look at those five things of what I want to give you three questions right now to think about. Number one, what stirs in your heart when you see that? Number two, 
what rises in your heart when maybe with some fear, resistance when you see that, and what do you most need from God in order to live that? Let me give you those three questions again. Number one, what intrigues you with that? What stirs in your heart as you see those five things that are there as an invitation? Number two, is there any resistance, any fear, any intimidation? And number three, what do you need from God as you, as you take a look at that? What we'll do is when we, we, we reconvene, we'll then now take a look at Bishop Fobb's vision for forming missionary disciples. But let's take a, look, let's take a break right now and in our small groups right now, unpack those five things.